Hello everyone, thank you for joining us for this important forum as we prepare for the November elections. My name is Terry Hopkins. I have the pleasure of serving as the President and CEO of the Grants Pass and Josephine County Chamber of Commerce. This forum is a testament to the importance of civic engagement and the responsibility we all share in shaping the future of our community. Voting is not just a right, but a critical way for each of us to have a voice in the policies and decisions that affect our businesses, our economy, and our families. The choices we make at the ballot box have a lasting impact on the prosperity of our community and Oregon as a whole. As the Chamber of Commerce, we stand as an advocate for our local businesses. Our goal is to ensure that the needs of the businesses, owners, employees, and entrepreneurs are heard by those in positions of leadership. That's why tonight is so important. We're bringing together the candidates running for Oregon Senate District 2 so that you, the voters, can better understand their values, their strategies, and how they plan to support the growth of business and economic development in our district. Our local businesses are the heartbeat of this community, providing jobs, supporting families, and contributing to the quality of the life we all enjoy. Tonight, you will hear directly from the candidates about how they intend to support and the heartbeat and advocate for the policies that will help our businesses thrive. Thank you again for being here and for your commitment to the future of Grants Pass and Oregon as a whole. Let's begin. We are joined today by candidate Noah Robinson, PhD, and candidate for Oregon Senate District 2. Noah, welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Our pleasure. So here's the rules. We're going to begin with the forum with a two-minute self-introduction. I've got a few questions that we'll roll through. Each of those questions will have 90 seconds to answer. And at the end, we'll give you two minutes just to kind of recap and let voters know why you're their choice. That okay. sounds great. Uh, with that, thank you for being here. Let's begin with that self-introduction and let listeners know a little bit about yourself and why you feel they should vote for you. Wonderful. Yeah, I, I'm, my, I'm running to replace my dad, Art Robbins, who's the current senator. Um, I, what we're trying to do is bring common sense to Salem. It's, they're totally out of control. They take vast amounts of our tax money. Um, they're trying to raise taxes even more now. Um, and they spend it unwisely. Right now they're spending $600 million fixing up the Capitol building. Uh, we figure that that's $2,500 a square foot. My, every senator's office is, without counting the hallway, over $1.6 million for renovation. Okay, so that makes no sense to me. And I think you find that everywhere. The government is usually inefficient as a problem with government. There are some things they have to do, of course. And, but we need to have common sense, and we need to uh, not make mistakes. Um, on education, education is a very big deal to me because um, children's lives, how, they're, how, they, what, how they do, depends upon how well they're educated. And they don't learn to read at any reasonable rate in the public schools. And since I've worked in the homeschool industry and know quite a bit about it, I just look at it as a very frustrating situation because it's so easy to educate children, you just have to do it. And so I'd like to work on that, improve their reading, do things, and of course you realize the Republicans are in the minority, but when you come up with a common sense solution, we ought to be able to get it through the legislature either way. Now that doesn't always work, but I'd like to do that. I'm also very much against deal making, where you make deals. I think everything should be very straightforward. Here's what you stand for, here's what you vote for. You look at the legislation, if the final product isn't something you can tolerate, you vote no. Don't say, well, you know, they made it a little bit less bad, so we won't vote, so we're gonna vote yes for it just as a sort of a deal, because all that does is, you, you know what happens, the Democrats will propose something worse and then get all the Republicans to make it bipartisan by saying, hey, we'll tone it down a little bit. So we need to stop doing that. So um, I am just very much in favor of a straightforward approach to, uh, to governing, and I'm looking forward to doing that. Great, thank you. And with that, let's just dive right into one of those that you might be mentioning. Uh, but one of the issues that we're hearing uh, from our membership is uh, Measure 118. It's get garnered quite a bit of concern from our business community. The measure would impose a 3% tax on many of Oregon's businesses with a promise to divvy up the money raised among Oregon's 4 million residents, no matter what their age. Are you in support or opposition of Measure 118 and why? 
Well, I'm very much against it. Okay. I even put in a statement in the voters' pamphlet against it. This is just a 3% sales tax, essentially. It's going to come out of the business. It's going to hurt the businesses. But who's going to pay for it is the consumers, because everything you buy is going to go up in price. And it's going to go up by more than 3%, because you know the suppliers of the people that you deal with have to pay the 3% if they're in Oregon. So what's going to happen? Everybody's going to move out of Oregon that can. Prices will go up. Um, the, the, the money they say they're going to give you is not going to cover the increased costs, and everybody loses. These sorts of things don't work. It sounds great, but it's not a good idea. <laughs> I, well, it doesn't sound great, but I mean, the money, it sounds great to get the money, but it just doesn't work. <laughs> well, then let's backtrack. So, you know, Measure 118 uh, ahead of us. Let's look back just a little bit uh, to a measure that previously passed and still faces some scrutiny. Uh, and it has seen some revisions, but Oregon voters passed Measure 110 in November of 2020, uh, which decriminalized the possession of hard drugs. You know, earlier this year, obviously, we saw House Bill 4002 that made changes to the bill, which recriminalized uh, the possession in our state. But do you feel that the revisions enacted by uh, House Bill 4002 were sufficient? Uh, and how would you further engage on the conversations around Measure 110? Well, I think it should have been stronger. I mean, I'm glad we got somewhere, but my dad voted against that bill simply not because he was against recriminalizing, but because he wanted it, wanted them to go farther. For example, they they uh, recriminalized hard drugs, but you can only go to you can go to jail, but really only if you want to. Now I know that the police are now able to stop people because of the hard if they find them with drugs, which is a big improvement. But I think we need something stronger, and I think we also need to get the government completely out of the drug business. They're getting tax money for marijuana. That's just, they have government-sponsored marijuana. Mar marijuana isn't good for you. It's just, a, it's maybe more mild, but actually there's a lot of evidence that it causes uh, psychosis and, uh, and major problems. So I think we need strict rules against these drugs, and I think that uh, you're caught taking drugs repeatedly, I think it should be a, a fairly major offense. So I think something should be stronger should be done, because this is a big issue. And when you look at the homeless people on the street, many of them are on drugs. You see these people to just drive down the street. This is a this is a bad thing, and this everyone, including government agencies, should make it clear to everyone that this is not something they should be doing. We should have strict penalties against it. So I think we need something stronger. Excellent. So let's move away just a little bit from those ballot measures, whether it's past or present, and talk about some of the opportunities that you have to represent us. Now let's talk a little bit about small business support. Obviously, you know the Chamber's mission is to support and promote local commerce through communication, advocacy, and partnerships, and that we believe that small businesses are the backbone of our local economy. Uh, what policies uh, would you support or introduce that help small businesses thrive, and especially in rural communities like us here in Grants Pass? Well, I would say a lot of things. Most of it comes down to basically getting the government out of their way. Businesses do really well when their taxes are low, when they don't, when they have a minimum of government interference, interference a minimum of regulation. In rural communities, for example, the farmers are very important, and they make it very difficult for them to get, get irrigation water. They have, they're, they're putting in uh, this, this new fire mapping, right? This has got everybody worried. And this is not, I mean, everyone's happy to take some advice, you know, hey, you might want to cut your bushes, but when the state is going to come in and say, you have to do this, and then people's insurance rates go up, or they can't get their insur insurance at all, and it's just, a, it's, it's just a disaster. So I think we need less state interference, and our, our small businesses are wonderful. They can do a fantastic job if the government just stays out of their way. So I'm just looking to cut regulations and cut back on things that interfere with them so they can do well. Excellent. So we do a business survey uh, every year, and uh, workforce development, it, of course, always a topic. In uh, the recent business surveys, uh, many of our local businesses report that uh, it's their number one challenge of finding skilled workers. Yeah. Uh, what initiatives could you push uh, for improvement of workforce development and ensure businesses have ex access to the talent that they want to succeed? Well, I would go back to um, introductory education. My dad introduced a bill which I am very much in favor of and we've reintroduced and we'd like to see it passed if we could get it through. Simply, homeschool mothers teach their children to read. It takes them six months or so, you know, half an hour a day. It's pretty easy with phonics. And once you get them going, you get them reading. At a young age, things go well. And it's really the biggest thing in education because if you learn to read at a young age, no matter what the quality of your school is, you will you have an opportunity to progress. 
And so we introduced a bill that would simply allow any school district to hire anybody, regardless of teaching credentials or, or approval from the state, to teach reading. The principal gets to decide you know, whether they're qualified, and some people are good at it, some people aren't, but almost anyone can do it. And the idea is to sit down with the children from the very beginning, teach them to read by phonics, and then from there, things should be a lot easier. So we'd like to see that done because it's so easy to do. I know there's I mean, retired homeschool mothers all, all over the place that would be happy to do it. And there are you know, teachers, all sorts of people that could teach our children to read. All you've got to do is sit down beside them when they're young, when it's easy, and teach them to read. And that's something I'm focusing on. There's a lot of improvements you can make in the schools, but that's one thing that you should be able to very easily implement that would make a big difference. And I know that takes a while. The children grow up, they're looking for workers now. But that is, I think, uh, that's one thing I'm focused on. Excellent. So here locally, you know, uh, we t rely a lot on tourism in our local economy. Uh, you know, it's a major economic driver in Southern Oregon. Uh, you know, what would you do in, to enhance that tourism sector and support local businesses that depend on the industry? Well, I think it gets, again, gets back to cutting regulations um, and, ha and keeping taxes down. Because Anytime you raise taxes, anytime you increase regulations, anything you do to the businesses that get in the way gets in, in, interferes with the tourism. I mean, it, it, getting back to the fire mapping, how are we going to uh, how are we going to support these things when everybody is you can't afford insurance, you can't afford housing either, and that gets that gets back to another issue that homelessness is partly caused by drugs and partly caused by expensive housing, and houses don't have to be this expensive. And that's a state-generated problem because they control where houses can be built. And this is something unusual we have in Oregon. This goes back to Measure 100 quite a while back. But most states don't do that, and they don't have a problem. So we need to do, do things that will make it easier for people to build houses, that will lower the price of housing. And we also, you know, illegal immigration, <laughs> state using up housing as well. So this, 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 this is a, that's a national issue. It's not so much a state issue, except we should not be a sanctuary state. <laughs> So um, I, that's, that's what I would do, basically. Excellent. Let the tourism thrive by getting out of the way. Yeah, and if I may follow up on that just a little bit, dive just a little bit deeper uh, in supporting tourism, let me ask about uh, current Oregon statutes that require some of the monies uh, collected from lodging tax dollars to be reinvested in tourism promotion and tourism-related facilities. You know, we've seen over the years a couple proposals that want to change that current statute, take money away from uh, the reinvestments in tourism through lodging tax dollars to give back to the general fund. Uh, and the short question being is, would you support legislation that makes changes to the existing investments of lodging tax dollars back into tourism? Well, I think that the, I, I'm generally in favor of reducing those taxes as far as possible, but to the extent that we're taxing the lodging, taxing the hotels, I think it should stay in the community and be, and like you say, be reinvested there. So I'd have to look exactly at what legislation you're talking about. I can't sort of, sort of commit, but I, I would not be in favor of taking that money and just throwing it in the general fund because obviously it makes more sense to leave it here. Fair enough. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Let's talk, uh, you know, maybe a little bit of a hard one, and, and you mentioned it in the beginning, but, you know, legislative collaboration is, is a key uh -huh. topic, hot button point, but how do you plan to collaborate with other lawmakers across party lines to pass legislation that supports the growth of businesses and economic development, and again, here in rural Oregon? <laughs> so specifically toward collaboration, because this is the hot button. Yeah. They all, we all want to get together and pass this stuff. Um, I, you... The, one thing people realize, in campaigns they talk about, you know, are people getting along up there? Well, the general public doesn't really care how well they're getting along, and the fact is everyone's, pol everyone's a politician. They all get along well. I mean, I, I'm on pretty good terms with all the Democrats up there because I worked with my dad. We disagree wildly on things. But you work, work with them to try to improve the red legislation, try to get r rational things passed. But I think it gets back again to this issue, which I think is a flaw that probably both parties are involved in, in which they think that you know collaboration involves making major compromises. There are things you can compromise on. I mean, obviously things like are somewhat subjective, like what's the speed limit on any particular highway? The legislature really isn't involved in that. But there are things like that that um, you can compromise on. But when it comes to principle, when it comes to something like that, you don't want to compromise. Let the bill bounce around until it's something enough people agree to to pass. Now, I know what's happening is the Democrats are just ramming everything through they want. But it shouldn't be that way. And I, I try to use logic with them and say, hey, this isn't a good idea, or this is a good idea. 
and just work with everybody. You work with everybody, but on the final analysis, your vote is based on principle. Wonderful. Yeah, if, if you knew that you could just walk in with one bill, get it passed, anything you wanted in this upcoming legislative oh boy. session, what's number one? Well, I'm interested in education. Yeah. And like I said, there, if, if I could pass one bill that wouldn't just be reading, I'd put a number of things in it to get the state out of the way, move it back to local control, empower the school boards. I think I, 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 you caught me with that one. I didn't realize it was coming. I, there might be something else if I thought about it. But it, it, what immediately comes to mind is educating our children is the most important thing we can do for them. I'm right now, I'm in favor of homeschooling. I, I advise people, don't go to the public schools. But the fact is most of the students do go to the public schools. So we need to give them the best education as possible. So that's what, that's what I would probably do. Great. Thank you for that. And uh, as you know, promised in the beginning, uh, we want to definitely not just answer my questions, but let our constituents, uh, or our membership, your constituents, just hear a little bit more from you and uh, the priorities as we head into this legislative session. So if we could give you two minutes and uh, just, just talk to the folks about why you're the best candidate. Okay. Well, I would, I'll approach it like I've been mentioning from a principal standpoint. What is best for the people of Oregon? What's right and wrong? What's, what's basically just a principled approach? We look at, there's, there's a lot of issues, of course, that come up. Many of them everyone agrees on. Those, those don't become contentious. But we need to do things that just lower the taxes for, the, for, for people. We don't need to be, let's talk about increasing the gas tax by an enormous amount. Well, why does the DOT need that much more money? We need to look at how they're spending the money they have now. I am interested in education. I'm interested in energy. The energy is a big deal. The electricity rates are rising very rapidly. People can't afford them. People, we have a large number of people's power is being coupled with off citizens all over the state. Can't afford electricity anymore. Why? That's because of policies that I mean, we, cl we closed a very good coal-fired plant up in Borden, basically just for political reasons. They won't allow us to build nuclear power plants here. All these things which could cut the price of electricity down, instead we're going toward this green agenda. We're going to do it all with solar panel and wind, which is very expensive and, and takes a lot, lot of land and doesn't work very well. So we just need a more common sense approach to governance. Stand back, let the people keep their money stay out of their way and let industry thrive. There's small businesses, larger businesses, everyone. Oregon is full of fantastic people that can do, a, do anything we need if we just get out of their way. Great. And again, no, I really appreciate this. Obviously, we believe heavily in that uh, civic engagement as a responsibility. Yes. Being able to hear from our elected leaders means a lot. Uh, no matter who's in that seat, we look forward to staying in contact and, and having our businesses here in Josephine County uh, have a voice. And so I really appreciate your time. If folks have questions for you or want to learn more about your campaign, where can they find you? I'm Robinson for Oregon.com. I'm happy to answer questions. Today. Mr. Robinson, it's been a pleasure. I okay. appreciate your time and good luck in the campaign. Well, thank you. You bet. I really appreciate it, too.